Now, I want you to turn your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 6. To Ephesians chapter 6. Now, we've been walking through this series called Masquerade. And we've been walking through talking about the masks that we wear in life, the things that we hide behind in life, the things that we do every single day to either do this, to either put on a false front, to, to project to the world what is not so, or that we try to hide what really is. That we try to put on the masks of life to, to, to try to allow the culture to believe something that is not accurate, something that is not real. And today what we're going to do is walk through this passage in Ephesians chapter 6 as we bring this series to a close to actually see what does God's word say about taking off the masks of life, uh, of taking off those masks that we use to hide ourselves, to, uh, to hide ourselves from the world, to hide ourselves from the culture, maybe to hide ourselves from the fear that we have every single day. And so we're going to walk through this passage. It's a familiar passage. Once we get into it, it's one I know that you have heard before, but there's a couple of nuances within this passage that I believe are, are really important for us to understand what it means to remove the masks of life. And so Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin reading with verse 10, and we're going to read through just 10 verses this morning. And it says this, 11 verses this morning, it says this in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with, stru- with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, Paul writing here, the utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I want you to underline or circle in your Bible, if you've got it open, verse 20. Paul writing, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Now, the reason that's important, Paul's writing this. Obviously, we know the story of Paul. Oftentimes, Paul found himself actually in chains for preaching the gospel, right? Oftentimes, he found himself being locked away, thrown in jail cells. We, we find where uh, there were times that he was beaten for preaching the message of the gospel, that he was stoned for preaching the message of the gospel, that he was mocked, run out of town. And eventually, as we know, uh, the Mamertine prison in Rome, eventually his head was cut off for preaching the gospel. And so when he is using that phrase, an ambassador in chains, he literally is talking about, I am in shackles for preaching the name and the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that's important that we recognize what Paul is writing, but it's also important that we recognize, and the reason I wanted you to underline or to circle that in your Bible is this, is that oftentimes we as followers of Christ find ourselves also as ambassador, ambassadors in chains. Now, it's a different type of chain. We, none of us, are going to be thrown in jail tonight for what we believe. You're not going to walk uh, back into uh, the neighborhoods of this community and police are going to show up at your door and and lock you up and throw you in jail because you showed up at Dan River Church this morning. That's not going to happen. No one's going to throw rocks at you tonight when you uh, get back to your house because you went to church today. That's not going to happen. But something far more sinister... Something far more difficult, something far more destructive is true. And unfortunately, these chains that we're talking about are not the chains that the world is throwing at us. They're chains that we are willingly being allowed to lock us down. The chains that we are taking on ourselves, and how, here's how we do it, by putting on the masks of life, by trying to be in this culture what we are not, to try to hide behind face uh, masks and, and false fronts and, and untruths in our own walk and in our own life that will keep us locked away from the freedom that God wants to give to us. We heard it in the song this morning that we find freedom in Christ, that he sets us 
free. He sets us free indeed. But yet so often as followers of Christ, what we end up doing because of fear or because of the lack of uh, of self-awareness or self-acceptance, what we end up doing is we end up hiding behind what is not real. And when we do that as ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we willingly allow the shackles to be placed on our hands. We willingly allowed ourselves to, uh, to be locked away, to be shackled down with the chains of this culture and the chains of this world because we are not willing to simply be real. That's what this series has been about. That's what we've been talking about. And that's what today, what I want to walk through this passage with you today to look at is how we can find the freedom that God truly wants us to experience. What is it that we must do to experience that kind of freedom? And if we go into verse 10, In verse 10, Paul, uh, after writing about the relationship between husbands and wives and the the relationship of the church and talking about our relationships at work and and talking about how we can walk in wisdom and the faith as we look through the book of Ephesians, he comes to this last part of Ephesians in the last chapter and the last final verses of this book that he wrote to the church of Ephesus. And here's what he ends up saying in verse 10. He starts with that one word and he says, finally. In other words, hey, listen, all this stuff is important, but here, you better get this. This, this is the final word. In other words, what he's really saying is all this other stuff that I've talked about, of how husbands are to treat the wives and wives are to treat their husbands and and how parents are to treat their kids and their kids are are to treat their parents and how you're to to relate to others in life and relate to others in in work and how you're to, to live in this culture. None of it is possible unless you do this. Paul, in in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he uses that word finally, which is the Greek word uh, loe pulse, which literally means the rest of the whole. In other words, if you want to find completeness, if you want to find totality, if you want to find everything that you need to find complete hope and joy in life, finally, this, Paul says, this is it. This is it right here. This, This is the final word. So what's the final word? He goes on to say in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. I want you to underline that word, those words, in the Lord. And here's why I want you to underline them. Because all of us in our daily journeys, in our daily walk, we want to be strong. All of us want to walk through life with strength. All of us want to walk through life with success. All of us want to walk through life like figuring it out, man. We want to, we want to nail it. We want to do it. We want everything to go perfectly, man. We want to live a life that is full. We want to have everything that we could ever possibly want. We want to walk through life in strength. We want to be strong. Here's the problem. Oftentimes as followers of Christ, what we do is we want to be strong in life, but we leave out in the Lord. You see, what we do is we look for strength in the things of this culture. We look for strength in the things of this world. We look for strength in the, in the things that the world says are important, which, by the way, is why we end up putting those masks on. It's why we end up in life trying to be who we are not. It's why in life so often we, we, we see, whether on social media or whether in our, our personal relationships, in our inner relationships, regardless of where we might run into it, it's why we see so often followers of Christ that the label hypocrite is thrown onto them. That the word hypocrite is placed on them because what they live in real life is different than what they live on a Sunday morning sitting in church. You see, Paul says, finally, the final word, listen, the, the, the rest of the whole is this, be strong in the Lord. Meaning this, it's impossible to find strength. It's impossible to find joy. It's impossible for us to do all of the things that God wants us to do unless we are doing it in the Lord. It's why it's so important that we recognize the the truth of the gospel. It's why it's so important that we recognize the truth of God's word is that we dig into this book and find exactly what it is that God wants to give to us. We cannot be strong on our own. And so how do we find that strength? How do we live in the Lord? How do we stand in the power of his might? Well, it goes on to give us in this passage in verses you know, 12 and 13, 14, all the way down, it begins to talk about this journey, this battle that we're in, that we don't wrestle against people. You know, it's not like we're in this battle against individuals that are out there. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, you don't know the guy that I'm up against. I mean, yes, we all have those struggles and those challenges and relationships, but that is not our ultimate battle. Our ultimate battle against, is against Satan himself. John chapter 10, verse 10 says this, the thief, Satan, comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. His job, 
His mission in life is to take you down. He wants to stop you dead in your tracks. He wants to kill your spirit. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to blow up completely, bring to destruction any hope that you have for the future. That is Satan's plan. And so this passage tells us in verse 13, listen, we're not wrestling against this world. We're wrestling against Satan. And here's what Satan does. Satan uses the things of this world to take us down. And the things of this world, you know what they are? And we start putting those masks on. We start trying to be who we're not. We start trying to to show the world a different picture of who we really are because we're not happy with who we really are because we're evaluating who we are not based on what God says we are of who God says that we are, as we sang this morning, but based on what the world says we should be. And so we've got to recognize, man, how, how can we find that joy? How can we be strong in the Lord? Man, we've got to recognize very clearly As this passage tells us, man, we've got to dig into God's word, but we have to know this armor of God that God gives us. He gives us everything that we will need to stand up against the devil, to stand up against all the plans, the schemes of the devil. Now today, that's not what we're going to talk about. Because oftentimes when this passage is preached, it's also often preached very clearly uh, talking about putting on the armor of God so we can, man, we can handle the, the, the darts that are coming at us so we can stand against the world that's out there coming at us so Satan doesn't have a chance, doesn't have a prayer. But that's not what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is how we can be real because in this passage, as he begins to list out those, those things that make up the armor of God, he starts in verse 14 very clearly saying this. He says, stand there having girded your waist with truth. In other words, having put on the belt of truth. Now, oftentimes when we read in God's word, when we see the word truth, here's what we think of. We think of uh, either the gospel or we think of the Bible, God's word itself. We think that's what is truth. And so we think when it says there, having girded your waist with truth or putting on the belt of truth, we, we, we automatically run back to the idea that we've got to put on God's word that we've got to stand on God's word, that we've got to, you know, read this book to figure out how to live, that we've got to walk through life as this is our guidebook. Now, listen, all of those things are true, but that's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. That's not what he's saying. In fact, if you keep reading this passage, you go down a few verses and you find that it eventually says and talks about picking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So it's not like Paul was being redundant here. He didn't start talking about... God's word and then end with God's word. No, he was talking about something entirely different as he talked about putting on the armor of God. Meaning this is that this was the first thing that you must do if you are going to be able to stand up against the attacks of Satan. And what is it? Put on the belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? Well, if you look in the original Greek language here, that word in verse 14, when it says, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, uh, that's the Greek word aletheia, which literally means something that actually happened. In other words, it has nothing to do with God's word. It's not talking about the gospel here. It's talking about being real. In other words, it is impossible for us to put on the armor of God unless we are willing to be honest with ourselves and to remove the masks that we so often put on in life. In fact, if you go back in ancient culture, when uh, the, the, the soldiers of that day, when the warriors of that day would go to battle, You know, it wasn't like they were putting on the belt like that was just like an ornament. It was something that would look good or something that would hold their pants up. That's not why they put on belts. They put on belts because it was impossible for them to actually wear the armor unless they were wearing that belt because that belt actually held up their breastplate. It actually held up the shield that would cover their their vital organs when people were throwing spears and shooting arrows at them. They had to wear that belt in order to protect their lives. And so Paul uses that phraseology here. He uses that idea, that picture here to say, listen, if you're going to put on the armor of God, if you're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, if you are going to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the attacks of the devil, the first thing that you have to do is you have to get real. You have to recognize who you are, not according to the world, but according to God's word. That you have to recognize that God made you exactly the way that he made you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, that we are God's masterpiece. The Bible tells us back in the book of Genesis that he created us and made us exactly the way that we are and that he made us in his own image. You know what that tells me? It tells me this, God doesn't make a mistake. God made us exactly the way that we are for a reason, but yet so often what we're trying to do is to be anything but who we are. Man, I've seen people, you've seen them too. 
And they get their, their, their cell phones out and they've got their cameras on their cell phones and they're taking pictures of themselves, you know, and they take about 5,000 pictures of themselves in a certain way, you know, and they do all the different poses and they do different angles and then they get on their phone and they start, you know, cutting out and editing out the things they don't want the world to see, right? They cut out the bad angles, they cut out the bad hair, they cut out, you know, if it looks the wrong way and then they get into the filters at Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, all the filters so that they can change the way that they look, right? And they'll spend hours getting that picture just right, perfect, and they'll edit, and they'll edit, and they'll edit, so finally they can then hit the word post and put it up for the world to see exactly who they are. Now, you've all seen people do that. Am I right about that? Last week, I sat down with dinner with my wife and my, my kids, and we were sitting at a restaurant, and, and as we were sitting there, a couple came in and sat down across from us, and they had a, they had a, a young lady with them. She was probably 17, 18 years old. And they were sitting there, and the mom and dad were looking at the menu, trying to figure out what they wanted to eat. That's not what the daughter was doing. The daughter had her phone out, and she was sitting there, and she was. I mean, she was doing that until the waiter finally came, and the dad said, put the phone down, and let's order food. She took about 450 pictures before the salads came. And she was doing all of that stuff because she was trying to portray something to the world. And yet Paul says this, listen, you will not be able to stand in truth. You will not be able to stand against the attacks of Satan who is coming after you. You can count it, mark it down. You can believe in it. He is coming after you and you will not be able to stand against that attack if you are so focused on being who you really are not. God's word says this, put on the belt of truth. In other words, what really is? And recognize, man, God made you the way that you are. You are God's masterpiece. And rather than spending all of our time trying to be a reflection of this world, man, spend your time trying to be a reflection of the love of Jesus Christ because that's what makes all the difference in the world. And so that word truth is so vitally important. We talk about this idea of the masks that we wear in life. Why? Because number one, truth never changes. Truth is truth. If we stand in truth, if we put on the belt of truth, if we walk in truth, here's the cool thing. We never have to figure out and try to remember what truth is when we walk in truth, right? And here's the cool thing about truth. Go back to Proverbs chapter 12. In Proverbs chapter 12, uh, verse 19, there's a powerful verse here that I want to read to you that talks about the idea of truth. It says this, the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. The truthful lip is established forever. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can destroy it. Nothing can tear it down. Nothing can can descend on it and destroy it. Nothing at all. It is established forever. Why? Because it is based on truth. But the lying tongue quickly vanishes away. It's gone. It will be destroyed. It will be defeated. And we wonder why today our churches are so powerless. And I believe it's because so often followers of Christ have bought into this idea of trying to deceive ourselves and to deceive others by wearing the masks of life. We're trying to be who the world says we should be, what the world says is important for us to be, to try to be like the world. And what ends up happening is what God intended to be truth, to be established forever, quickly vanishes away. And we've seen all, it's all seen the Hollywood stars. Man, we've seen those stars that go through and man, you'll see them, they'll go out and they'll spend thousands and thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars on things like plastic surgery to try to be who either they once were or to be something that they're not. And that's why sometimes you'll see those pictures where they're walking out and they're, you know, they've got their, their face hidden because their, their lips kind of look like this big, you know, as they walk out of a out of a salon, or maybe they've you know, gotten plastic surgery and they've, they, they, they've kind of gotten those facelifts where they've pulled their, you know, their scalp back so far that when they cry, they cry up. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just pulled back so far. Why? Because they're trying to be who either they once were, trying to be who they're not. They're trying to deceive the world. And let's be honest, they're not deceiving anybody, right? Uh, the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 12, man, truth lasts forever. That when we stand on the word of God, when we stand in truth, man, the coolest thing, the most amazing thing is this, is that when we're walking in truth, when we remove the masks of life that we allow to shackle us down, to chain us down, what ends up happening is we're promised by the God of the universe and that will be established forever. Nothing can stop it. Man, that's good news because everything in this world is trying to stop you. Everything in this culture is trying to stop you dead in your tracks. 
Listen, I'm going to tell you something. What your vision ought to be, what your passion ought to be, what your desire ought to be is to not try to be what the world says you ought to be, but to be who you are. Because I've got to be honest with you. When you look at the world, when you look at our culture today, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to be like anything in the world, do you? I mean, you know, politically. Anybody here want to, uh, you know, kind of line up with the Republicans or line up with the Democrats right now? I've got to be honest with you. I'm not sure that's a good plan. Because both sides, it seems like, sometimes are going crazy. Am I right about that? Here's what I want to do. I don't want to try to be like the world. What I want to do is I want to be like Christ. I want the world to look at me and to see something that's different that's in the world. Why? Because the world is messed up. And yet all that we're trying to do is to be more and more like the world when God says, no, 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 you be more and more like me. Not me as in Jonathan, but me as in our Heavenly Father. That our vision, our passion ought to be in truth, to walk in truth so that we can be more like Christ. Why? Because when we do, that is something that nothing on this world can stop. Truth never changes. But not only does truth never change, it also, we understand John chapter 8 tells us, is that truth sets us free. We talk about how in the world are we going to get out of these shackles that hold us down? How are we going to get loose from this world that's trying to attack me? Here's how you do it. John chapter 8 says this, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. In other words, it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter the plans of Satan. It doesn't matter what the culture has for you. Here's the deal. When you stand on truth, when you are real in your walk and in your your faith and who you are before Christ, when you are real, when you're walking in truth, you will be free. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands here today, but probably there's some people sitting in this room today that feel like you're locked down. They probably feel like you're shackled by this thing called life. That when you wake up in the morning, it's like, man, I I don't even know if I can go on. I I don't even know if it's worth it. I don't even know if I should continue, man. I just, I don't know if I can make it another day. We all know people like that. And maybe it's us. And I think sometimes the reason that we feel that way is because we are basing our joy on what the world says we ought to find joy in. But God's word says this, joy will never be found here. Joy will never be found in what the culture has to offer. Joy will never be found in what the world is giving. What joy is found in is when we understand who we are before Christ and walking in truth, and that truth will make you free. It will let you go. It will loosen those shackles, those chains that hold us down, and we'll be able to begin to walk in in the kind of freedom and the kind of joy that only God can give. You see, truth never changes, and truth sets us free. But where do we find that truth? Well, it's very clear. Truth can only be found in Christ, in Christ alone. John chapter 14, when Jesus got his disciples together and he began talking with them about what was getting ready to happen, that he was about to be arrested, he was about to be crucified, nailed to a tree, that he was about to lose his life. And he began having a conversation with us. He said, listen, what I'm doing, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Man, I'm going to build a place for you. And it's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a place where, where every one of you is going to have your own place that's going to be built by God himself. And I'm going to prepare that place for you. Oh, and there's good news. And I'm coming back, and I'm going to take you there. And I'm going to take you there. And we're going to spend eternity there in that place that I'm preparing for you. And if I'm going there, listen, I'm going to come back and get you. And you're going to know how to get there. You'll know the way. In verse 5 of John chapter 14, Thomas did what most of us would do sitting there. He's like, wait a minute, that sounds pretty cool, but I don't know where you're going. I don't know how to get there. How, how did you, let me get my pen and paper. I want to write down the instructions here. I want to write down the directions here. But back then they didn't have iPhones. They had to write stuff down. And so how do I get there, God? I don't know where you're going and I don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. You see, the world will say that there's lots of different ways to find hope. The world will say there's lots of different ways to find life. The world will say that there's lots of different ways to find truth. But Jesus said, oh, no, 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 there's just one way. There's just one way. And it's in Christ and Christ alone. You see, when we get that, when we understand that truth, when we understand that it's only in Jesus that we can find that kind of life and and that kind of joy and that kind of freedom. It's only when we get there that we'll be able to go back to verse 10 and that we will finally be able to stand strong in the Lord. It's only when we find it in the name of Christ. And it brings us to the end game. So how how do we make sure that we're kind of putting all this together? Well, verse 19 says this, Paul writing... And for me, Paul says, that 
that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, I just want to make sure that in what I do, I let people know the truth. And then verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As I ought to speak. In other words, as the way that I ought to live. In other words, I don't want to be like the culture. I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be like Rome. I don't want to be like the religious leaders of the day. I don't want to be like those people who are constantly kind of holding us back and locking us down and shackling us away. What I want to be, I want to boldly be exactly who Christ calls me to be, and that is to tell people that Jesus is the way and that he's the truth and that he's the light. And when you believe in him, it will change everything. That's who I want to be. And let me just tell you, that is exactly who you should want to be too. And you think about Paul. Here's a guy who was locked away for preaching the gospel, for living that life of freedom. Here's a guy who was beaten, who was mocked. A guy that they picked up rocks and stones and, and stoned him, trying to kill him, leaving him for dead because he was walking in the truth, walking in freedom. He had removed the mask of the world. Here's a guy who would then eventually be led to his own death because he believed in the truth of Jesus because he believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, a guy that had every reason in the world to put the mask on and hide behind the world and hide behind that stuff so that he could get away from the things of this world. But that's not what he did. The Bible says that every day when Paul got up, he was excited to be able to do what he did. He actually said, man, I can't believe I get to do this today. I get to get up today and I get to tell people about Jesus. Yeah, they might throw me in jail. They might lock me up. They might throw rocks at me. They might beat me. They might mock me. And they might even cut off my head. I don't care. Because, man, today I get to be real. I get to stand in the freedom of God's word and the freedom of the gospel and tell people about Jesus. Man, I can't believe I get to do that. When's the last time you woke up in the morning and you put your feet on the floor and the first thought out of your mind is, man, I can't believe I get to do this. You see, I think what is often the case is we wake up in the morning, put our feet on the floor, and it's like, man, I can't do this again. We put our feet on the floor, it's like, man, it's, <laughs> I can't go on. We put our feet on the floor, it's like, man, I, I don't know if I can make it through the day. And here's why. Because we're basing our joy on what the world says is important. But when you base your joy on the freedom that comes in and through Christ and Christ alone, man, when you wake up in the morning, the world can't touch you. The culture can't destroy you. Satan can't stop you. And you'll wake up in the morning with a smile on your face like, man, I can't believe I get to do this. I can't believe I get to go to work. When's the last time you said that? I can't believe I get to go deal with that neighbor next door that I don't even like. I can't believe I get to do this. Why? Because you are walking in the freedom that comes from the truth. And when Christ sets you free, you are free indeed. So be free. Be real. Take off those masks. Stop trying to be who the culture tells you you need to be. And start being exactly who God made you to be. A person who is a sinner who has been saved radically by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the grace that is only found in and through him, by the mercy that only he can give. And when you recognize, man, I deserve to spend eternity in hell, but oh, good news, God has changed that forever and for eternity. And yes, man, I have hope today because Christ is within me. It'll change your outlook on everything. Scott, a little while ago, made a statement. A statement that i got to be honest with you, Scott, I disagree with. Because you said this, unless you're dead, God's not done with you. Here's the good news. Even if you are dead, God's not done with you. Because Jesus said, I prepare a place for you. And when you walk off the face of this broken down, hurting, painful, tragedy-filled earth that we see every single day, the the, 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 the sorrows that seem to be overwhelming every single day, man, we can't lose. Because when we leave this thing called earth... 
God has prepared a place for us where we'll spend eternity, where Revelation 21 says there's no more pain and there's no more sorrow and there's no more tears and there is no more death, where all the junk of this world is cast away. And guess what? Everything is made new. So I don't know about you, but I'm stopping to try to live like the world and try to find my joy in what the world has to offer because they don't have a prayer. I want to live my life according to the truth of God's word. And my friends, that's exactly what you ought to do too.